This video is brought to you by Surfshark. Hey everyone, Kaichin Kumba here. You know, it still kind of tickles me to this day. Back when I told people that I was getting really, really big in a Warhammer 40k, everyone and their mom was like, ah, Kaichin Kumba, he's that giant weeb on the internet, right? Of course he'd like the Tao. Of course he'd like the faction that has giant mecha and way too many samurai parallels. It only makes sense, right? But ha! Showed you people! We're Orky till the day we die! You ever seen our collection? Yeah, check this out! Stompas, Death Dreads, Killican, Squigs, and Boys! With Daka in hand, we green to the end, and we's making noise! Whoa! You good? Yep! Ugh. Well, Little G isn't wrong. In fact, we went into a two-part series not that long back talking about the Greenskin's cultural connection with the UK. But, my love of impractical and carefree Daka aside, in all honesty, yeah, I actually really do like the Tau. I've always told myself if I want to have fun with 40k, I'll play with orcs. But when I have to take this franchise seriously, which is rare, I side with the Tau. I mean, just look at this! Yeah, I got a bias for mechs and optimism, and I don't care! I love the actual sci-fi look to the units, their energy-based weapons, and I find the Tau to be an upliftingly unique race amidst the horde of generic fantasy races, but in space. Now, they are under the rulership of a totalitarian regime that uses aggressive, manipulative propaganda programs to keep Tau citizens ignorant of the horrors of the 40k universe, all the while exerting universal power and control over the populace, with Commander Farsight and his enclave being the only ones to really learn the truth. See, I don't get that. They're centuries ahead of mankind with tech and game, and a millennia ahead of us in real life. How did not a single Tau, Farsight enclaves especially, never develop something like a VPN? Well, despite 40,000 years of advancement and countless high-tech races in space, no one's ever developed the internet. But we do have it, and we have the tools to protect ourselves from censorship, identity theft, and not being able to watch Letterkenny without a Canadian IP address. Thanks for that, Hulu! And I do that with Surfshark. Now, if you've never heard of a VPN, basically when you connect to one, you're running your IP address through a separate encrypted server. Which means if anything or anyone is trying to get your info, rather than seeing your IP address, it sees the VPN server that you're connected to. This not only protects your information from Trojans, hackers, and identity theft, you can also skirt around region locks by connecting to one of Surfshark's VPN IPs in other countries, giving you access to sites and services you originally may not have access to due to your location. But what makes Surfshark stand out against other VPNs is the myriad of additional services that it provides, such as a kill switch that'll drop your internet connection should your VPN connection drop, a one subscription unlimited devices policy, allowing you to have protection on every single smartphone, computer, and tablet in your household, an IP rotator that constantly changes your connected IP address just to give these digital predators an even greater run around, and my personal favorite, a cookie pop-up blocker that just... Oh my god, I hate these pop-ups so much! So if you want to jump on the net with a strong peace of mind, hit up surfshark.deal slash gaijingoomba, link also in the description, and use the code gaijingoomba for 83% off your plan. And hey, you know, while we're at it, let's throw in three months extra for free. And if you end up not liking it, you got a 30-day money-back guarantee. So don't fall prey, get Surfshark today! Alright, Little G, that one was a bit goofy. Uh, anyway, to get back to my 100% predictable love of the Tao, I'm just gonna tell you right now. I do not love Tao because they're Japanese weeb bait. Cause they're not Japanese. Not by a long shot. Rather, they're Chinese, which in my opinion makes them far more interesting. But before I get into that, let me preface with a few things. One, I do not at all think GW planned for most of these cultural connections that I'm about to drop. I'm actually 99% certain this is all a string of coincidences. I mean, GW introduced the Tau all the way back in 2001, and only with a few exceptions, the connections that I have between Tau and China today really hadn't come to pass until after the 2010s. But despite all that, the connections that I have between the Tao and China are so numerous and interesting that I thought it would make for a really cool cultural and tabletop games video. Two, nowhere in this video do I want to misrepresent or slander China as a whole. While Japan is my core interest, China's history, culture, folklore, and theologies has always garnered my interest. I'm just garbage at Chinese pronunciation, so please forgive my butcherings. China as a people and a culture is freaking cool in my book, but as a researcher, I do have to be objective in my observations, for better or worse. And some of the observational connections I found between China and the Tao are... Well, let's just say they're haunting at times. 
And three. Having only just gotten into the 40k universe just a few months ago, I'm not exactly the most well-versed in the intricacies of the history and plot of this 40-year-old franchise, so I wanted to get some help. And thankfully, I'm happy to introduce to you all the YouTuber that solidified my love and interest in 40k's lore through his majestic baritone voice, Pancreas No Work. Hello, hello everyone. I've been graciously allowed to talk to you about the Tau Empire and all of their blue and technological glory. So, Pank, in your expert opinion, what can you tell us about the past history of the Tau? Before they became the advanced spacefaring race they are in modern 40k, they were cavemen. Unlike a lot of races and factions in 40k, Daddy didn't hand them all of the scientific and or magical prowess in the world, so they had to make do with advancing up the tech tree in the old-fashioned way. Eventually, they formed themselves into four factions that were permanently locked in a state of war with one another. Not the best circumstances, all told. All that would come to a rather abrupt end with the introduction of a fifth group of Tau, the Ethereals. Through unparalleled diplomacy <coughs> and maybe some mind control, they united these warring states and ushered in a golden age. So if there's one thing that could be said about China's historical past is that there were a lot of civil wars and rebellions. And no, that's not a knock against China's overall stability. Heck, the country's got 3,500 years of written history, so considering it's one of the oldest nations on Earth, it's going to have the statistical probability of having a metric ton of internal conflict. Regardless, though, from the battles of China's prehistory tribes, to the Yellow Turban Rebellion, to the Five Dynasties and Ten Kingdoms period, China's seen a lot of civil upheaval. I mean, geez, even in the modern era between 1850 and 1968, there was a big chunk of civil conflicts. Not the least of which was the Chinese Civil War between Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong between 1948 and 1949. But despite the years of hardship after Mao took power, this was mostly the end of China's centuries-long pattern of civil wars, mirroring the cultural lead-up between the warring tribes of the Tao and their unification under the Ethereals. Funny you mentioned Mao, because the social structure the Ethereals placed on the Tao is where the whole concept of the loose-skinned fish people being commies comes from. The Ethereals, once they united the Tao, formed them into a caste system based on which of the four empires they previously belonged to. The Ethereals naturally sat at the top of this caste system, but for the rest of them, calling it a caste system is a bit tricky. None of the castes aside from the Ethereals are actually more or less than the others, they just have differing roles. That being said, you can't switch caste. There's no social mobility at all in the Tao Empire, and the Ethereals control is such that they mandate when and with who you make children with for the good of the Empire. Every action you take must ultimately serve the greater good, be that what is actually best for the Empire or what the Ethereals want done at any given moment. First off, the Firecast. As a war game, these fellas naturally get the most attention. They're the folk you see most in the artwork, the ones with the most presence in the setting, and the ones who get gunned down whenever a space marine needs to be shown looking cool. They're built for war and nothing but, and do everything from piloting battlesuits to fighting in the trenches. They're even genetically modified to be stronger and taller than normal Tau, though they are still shorter than most humans and roughly as strong as the average Guardsmen. It may be a meme that the Tau don't go to melee combat, but it's a meme for a reason. Besides, would you want to get in chain axe range of a Cornate Berserker? After them is the Aircast. They're the Tau that are in charge of piloting vehicles that aren't battle suits, so if you see a Tau aircraft or spaceship, there's probably an aircraft member bombing whatever's below them into oblivion. Aircast members are even genetically modified to handle extreme G forces to make them all the better at being pilots. Then there's the Earthcast, the Tau in charge of creating and maintaining technology. If you've ever been mad at the Tau railgun because it ignored your invulnerable save and sent Gilliman straight to Hell, you can thank these fine lads for that. Finally, we have the Watercast. These are the Tau diplomats, spies, and all the other Black Ops stuff you'd expect. On the one hand, the Imperial Inquisition actually considers them to be the highest priority threats. This is because Tau propaganda causes the Imperium more losses in manpower and equipment from defectors than any fire warrior could ever hope to. On the other hand, this is a war game setting. No one wants to hear about things being resolved peacefully, they want shooty shooty bang bang, so don't expect too much presence from the Watercast in the lore. That being said, there's a Tau diplomat and a Caiaphas Cain book with more personality than 90% of all Imperial characters, so they've got that going for them. So I'm gonna take a hard right turn here and talk about just the word Tao in retrospect to China, because I think we all know the correlation here. Exactly. See, a lot of people love to say Tao's casts of fire, air, water, and earth are popular because Avatar The Last Airbender was popular. <clears throat> yeah, who would, who would do that? But really, the Tao cast system has five, not four elements. The ethereals count. Now, let's look at Tao other Tao. Within the philosophy, there are five elements of fire, earth, metal, water, and wood, each one acting as a checks and balances system for the others. But unlike our more alchemical comprehension of the four elements, the five in Tao represent quite literally all things. The five elements are associated with five colors, five tissues, five hollow and solid organs, five emotional states, planets, heavenly animals, virtues, senses, I mean no hyperbole here when I say that the five elements of Taoism corresponds with all things in existence. And 
All these things which the five elements are bound on must stay in complete balance. An excess of the fire-related emotion of joy, for example, is just as problematic as the metal-related emotion of sadness or the water-related emotion of fear in Taoism. This is basically identical to the sociological philosophies of Tao society. Each of the five elemental castes represent a separate aspect of Tao life, yet they are all seen as equally important. Firecast warriors are just as important as watercast diplomats. Earthcast engineers and the ships that they make are just as important as the aircast aeronauts who pilot them. Just like the Chinese Tao elements, there are five separate but equal aspects to all of existence within the Tao Empire, each one interacting with the others yet are still independent from them. And in all things, there is balance. Tao law states that all of the other castes must have a balanced population and... Man, doesn't that just remind me of the one-child policy that China had a while back? Again, not related, but... Huh. Now, all this of course is speaking from a philosophical stance, but what about something more concrete and real? Well, there's one thing in China even today that has me raising my eyebrow about its relation with the Tao and social immobility. China has a population registration system called the Hu Kou or Hu Ji. It's basically a form that contains your legal address, sector of activity, religion, physical description, and your status of either being urban or rural, and it's this last one that's causing a bit of an issue in China. See, your status of urban or rural basically will dictate your accessibility to health insurance, retirement funding, unemployment insurance, work insurance, maternity benefits, and housing funds. And from my understanding, it also affects your accessibility to certain jobs, schools, and hospitals. This system originally was set up as a way to try and fill the various independent needs of each lifestyle, but when it comes to moving across country to different places in China, there's a bit of a problem. Because if someone wanted to move from the countryside in Western China to Beijing or Shanghai, due to their registry as rural, they would be denied a lot of those aforementioned social services as a rural Hu Kou holder. That doesn't necessarily mean you're screwed as a rural holder. After all, you do get preferential allocation of residential land and have some unique flexibility with government issue mandates like the Wan Child Act back in the day. But the point is, in China, where you're born and what status you have is typically where you're gonna be stuck. You can't easily move from one lifestyle to another, just as you can't really move from one Tao cast to another if you wanted to change jobs. Though despite the rigid system the Tao set up, they flourished as a society faster than any other race in the galaxy. The only other races who likely advanced faster than them were the Elder and the Krork, and that's cheating because the Old Ones gave them everything they could ever ask for and more if not outright creating them. Sorry to say, fans of the boys, but the Orcs had access to secondhand creative mode at first. As for the Tao, it was largely by themselves. While older lore hints at the Eldar having a hand in their creation, and newer lore suggests they trade with the Votan, they were completely isolated from the rest of the galaxy for millennia. To say everything the Tao did was in the hands of others is just plain not giving them enough credit. Cut off as they were, they went from a group of Stone Age primitives to a galactic civilization in just a few millennia. Sure, they don't have equivalents to the higher end stuff the other factions have, but that's just because those societies have been around for tens of thousands and in some cases millions of years. To say they're not as intelligent because they didn't have 65 million years of galactic dominance like the Eldar is just dismissive. Likewise with China. Between 1978 and today, China went from being the cheap labor, goods, and manufacturing center of the world to the second largest world power. Come the turn of the millennium came the turn of Chinese GDP. I know that really doesn't seem like a real one-to-one -one connection with the Tao, but how funny is it that both of these two societies went from dismal to dominant faster than any other societies in their comparative universes? There's something neat about how the Tao went about expanding their realm once they got into the galaxy at large. They didn't just do it through war. Oh sure, that's a tool they have in their arsenal, don't get me wrong. Again, tabletop war game. The Tao are more than willing to throw hands if the situation calls for it. But unlike almost anyone else, they prefer to use soft power to expand. I mentioned earlier that the water cast are considered higher threats than any fire cast members, and it's with good reason. There's a wonderful bit in a Caiaphas Kane novel where Kane and company make a truce with the Tao because Tyranids coming to eat everything in a 20 light year radius is a bit more pressing of an issue than a border skirmish. The water cast diplomat even says that the Tao will happily help rebuild the planet the fighting was on, and this makes the Imperials balk. Why would they complain about free help? Well, because the buildings and material would come from the Tao, the Tao would be overseeing the reconstruction efforts, and the Tao would be the ones getting all the credit for it. Whether or not the Tao took over at that point would be irrelevant, because the populace would be on their side once all was said and done. It's easy to hate the Xeno when he doesn't give you free housing, basic living conditions, and all that other stuff that the Imperium doesn't. This isn't a hypothetical fear either, the Tao have done this with other alien races such as the Crute and Vespid. They're happy to make nice with other races, both out of a belief that it's the right thing to do and because they usually come out on top in these matters. They'll even let you keep your religion, though you'd best put the priorities of the greater good over the Emperor. Now, there have been a lot of things that China's done over the last 20 years to develop its diplomatic soft power worldwide, but the most ambitious has been their Belt and Road Initiative. 
those ones called One Belt, One Road Initiative, I wonder why, and before that, a strategy called the Silk Road Economic Belt back in 2013. And that's honestly what it looks like. Like the Silk Road of old, it's a major trade route that hits shipping and trading hubs all over Asia, Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. However, unlike the olden days when the control of trade was founded at the tip of the sword, in 2013, China started doing it by loaning out a trillion dollars to 150 different countries, most of which were underdeveloped and struggling. In this, China offered money to countries like Tajikistan, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Kenya, Ethiopia, and Bangladesh with very little in the way of stipulations in order for these countries to develop better infrastructure. However, the building of said infrastructure, such as ports, power plants, rail systems, and so on, were to be done by Chinese companies, not domestic ones. And if the countries couldn't pay back on their loans, which many of them can't right now, then China would either lease their territory or take natural resources as collateral. The overall goal of these loans, theoretically speaking, is that China would loan the money to politicians with no oversight, politicians of struggling nations would use it to win over the hearts of people as infrastructure was being built, and then the people and politicians would see China as saviors where Western powers and the global bank failed them. Therefore, these people, politicians, and countries would be more ready and willing to back China's side of things during things like UN votes or other international stage theater. Isn't that exactly what the Tao are doing to Imperial Worlds in 40k? The Tao Empire targets fringe worlds on the Imperium and offers these long-forgotten, unstable, chaotic planets the ability to thrive and grow under the Tao Empire. Now, granted, China has not tried to use soft power in this way to directly take over countries like the Tao do with Imperium Worlds, but the soft power game here is the exact same. Unfortunately for everyone, the Tao are no strangers to violence. Their prehistory was them being permanently locked in a four-way war, remember? When push comes to shove, they can fight just as well as anyone else and will conquer Imperial worlds with gusto. For example, when the Imperium first deployed Titans against them, the Tao thought they were a myth, mere propaganda to make them fear something that didn't exist. Then they noticed that those churches in the distance were getting closer and swiftly realized that the Imperium doesn't need propaganda when you have robots the size of Notre Dame. That being said, they developed counters to Imperial Titans so effective that the Mechanicus refuses to deploy Titan legions to Tau contested battle zones, at least until Tau air forces have been destroyed and certain battle suits designed to counter them are eliminated. They're not an instant win button, if for no other reason than the Imperium always has more titans to toss their way, but it speaks volumes to the Tau's military prowess. The worst comes regarding the ethereal's treatment of those who go against their greater good, and their general demeanor towards those under them. Other Tau are not allowed to interfere in ethereal politics except in matters related to their field. Oh sure, the Earthcast engineer gets their say in how the tech is made, but the ethereals are the ones who determine how it's used. Speaking of the ethereals, they also so rarely kill anyone outright. Instead, you're sent to be re-educated. After all, if you brainwash someone, you can still put them to work when you're done. They're also more than happy to make individuals disappear if they need to, and while they don't straight up kill you normally, redeploying you to the same system as the Black Templars is just a roundabout way of going about it. In certain cases, they may even declare entire races to be incapable of saving and coming about towards the greater good, deserving only extermination. That being said, the races on that list are ones like the Tyranids, Orcs, and Dark Eldar. Kinda hard to say those guys don't have it coming. Okay, remember when I said that I had to be objective in this video for better or worse? Well, here comes the worse. For a very large chunk of history, the Chinese government and military has been accused of doing some incredibly terrible things in the name of expansionism and control. For example, aggressive sinicization with Tibetans, Manchu, and Uyghurs in a broad sense, but there's also more specific events such as the 228 incident in Taiwan. Even at home, things like the zero COVID lockdown, mortgage strikes, and the responses of the authorities to those events are just showing how much of a stranglehold the Chinese government has over its citizens. I could go more into detail about this unfortunate connection I found between the Tao and China, but I think the majority of you watching can already piece together some specifics here. Some people get sick of the Ethereal's domination, however, most notably the Farsight Enclaves. Headed by the titular commander Farsight, he was sick of the crap the Ethereal's continued to pull, including killing his mentor. Pardon me, forcing him to kill his mentor so they could harvest his brain. Normally, the Ethereal's wouldn't give him a chance to pull away, but he was in the perfect position to pull it off. After the Damocles Crusade, where the Imperium and Tau first met and went to blows, he was given charge of retaking Lost Tau worlds and expanding where he could. Three Ethereal's were set alongside his force to make sure everything was going according to plan. But in an absolute cavalcade, 
state of things going wrong for the Ethereals. Farsight not only found out that the Ethereals were lying about things such as just how small the Tau were in comparison to the Imperium, but also that demons were in fact a real thing and not just some whack looking aliens that turn into smoke when you kill them. Combined with the fact that said demons killed the Ethereals and Farsight took his chance to dip as quickly as he could. The force serving under him was all too happy to oblige his free spirit and the Farsight Enclaves were born. Four systems free of not only the cruelties of the Tau Empire but the 40k galaxy at large. They're some of the most heavily defended places in the galaxy, short of Terra itself and Cadia before it got Abaddon for the 13th time. And probably the only place in the galaxy where human rights aren't the punchline to the world's most depressing joke. This finally brings me to the most interesting connection of all between China and the Tau. Within the younger generation of Chinese, there have been pockets of upheaval popping up here and there. First, almost exclusively online, but lately some of these youths are taking to the streets and protest the CCP. Rooted in frustrations of the aforementioned zero COVID policy, poor housing market, and exposure to exterior social media, there's now some headbutting between Little Pinks, the internet name for young Chinese nationalists, and Rebels, the name for Chinese youths who are reassessing what they've been taught, thinking about it for themselves, and pushing back against it. One of my favorite examples of this is a Chinese gamer in 2021 who thought it was kind of dumb for the government to ban a bunch of games out of nowhere. This began their process of a lot of self-reflection and personal research online using VPNs to bypass firewalls, coming to the conclusion that things aren't as simple as he'd been taught. Bit by bit, he reconstructed the way he thought and realized just how limited he had been with his thinking. I honestly can't think of a better comparison with the Enclave, Farsight himself especially. Throughout the two Black Library Farsight books, Crisis of Faith and Empire of Lies, just like China's rebels, he too spent a lot of time and thought, slowly entertaining the ideas of questioning the authoritative rhetoric of the Ethereals, and after seeing just how bad things were with the orcs, demons, and other horrors of the 40k universe, he broke away and put priority on what he believed to be the real threats to his people, threats that the Ethereals have actively been hiding in order to keep the Tao Empire complacent and ignorant. Man, I don't know, you got anything else to add, Pink? I have no idea that the Tao had this much shine in them before working on this video, man. Now that I'm aware of it, I'm going to be looking more into Tao books and trying to catch all these comparisons that have been made. Definitely going to have to look into them more if I ever make more content on the history behind the Tao. It honestly makes me feel a bit more fondly towards the Tao. A lot of the big Warhammer factions have some pretty hefty historical backing, be it the Roman and Gothic fields of the Imperium or the Holy Roman Empire influencing the Empire of Man. Nice to know the Tao aren't left out of the club, even if it's sometimes coincidental. Still prefer my Eldar though, I'm afraid. Once an Elven fanboy, always an Elven fanboy. Space magic is cool, you know? But I do still have one thing I'd like to say. I know you just gave me pretty ample evidence that the Tao parallel China in a whole lot of ways, but I think you're underestimating just how weeby they can be. Really? Even after all that? We didn't even cover everything I originally wanted to in this video, like the Tao's greatest military mind commander Pure Tide and his parallels to China's greatest military commander Sun Tzu. Both men having their war theologies cataloged for all time for future warriors and having weirdly similar quotes too. Still man, I'd bet good money there's a couple of similarities they share with Japan, even if they're a bit more surface level than everything here. If anyone cares to hear me out, I've got a pair of videos on the Tao over on my channel, including one Mr. Gooba himself was gracious enough to appear in. Seems I'll never completely get away from Japan. But but I think you'll like what I have to say over on Banks' video on his channel. Real quick though, a big thanks to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. If you want some online protection that would keep even the Ethereals out, hit up my description link and use my code GAIJINGUMA to get 83% off your plan and get 3 months extra for free. Alright bud, let's go see what this is all really about.